pouvoir entraîner avec euh, maintenant une intervention de, du professeur Nicolas Robinson sur euh, le principe de résilience. Merci beaucoup. I wish to join all the other panelists today and speakers and congratulating Professor Long, the Club de Jeuniste, the other sponsors of this wonderful conference. It's very timely, knowing that. And, Uh, less than two weeks, we will be seeing the decisions from Nairobi in the Intergovernmental Consultation. Uh, I have to confess at the beginning that I have erred in the past. And my error is that I did not include the principle of resilience in the World uh, Charter for Nature when I helped draft it. And I did not insist on including it in the covenant on environment and development that the IUCN and the International Council on Environmental Law developed. So what you hear today is the progressive development of uh, the thinking along these lines, because the principle of resilience is in the global pact for the environment, and it answers those who say nothing new has come. But I will argue it is not new. I will make three points. I will discuss the character of resilience. And secondly, I will look at alternative views of how should resilience be considered in law. And third, I will look at the benefits of recognizing the principle of resilience. Earth, with all its ecosystems, and with our civilization, our human civilization, has entered a new epoch, as Edith Brown twice observed, the epoch of the Anthropocene. Patterns of nature and society from the Holocene epic have been disrupted by the consequences of climate change, industrialization, and the rapid growth of our human population. All states now must adapt to the Earth's transformed physical and natural environment, but they dimly perceive this reality. Laws and policies for finance, education, commerce, environmental protection, security and all other sectors of life are largely products of the benign years and centuries of the Holocene. States would rather sustain business as usual than embrace new policies and laws that could mitigate and avert the coming disruptions. This is evident from the rather shallow commitments made under the Paris Climate Change Agreement for the nationally determined contributions. So states are not well equipped today to deal with the impacts of the Anthropocene. Governments at all levels need principles to guide their responses to environmental disruption and enable societies to reset an equilibrium that accommodates change. General principles of law have always served to guide society. Human nature embraces norms of fairness and fair dealing, of justice and of access to justice, and of fundamental human rights. The convulsions that are predicted throughout the Anthropocene require society to redouble its support for these traditional norms. But more is now required. IUCN's World Commission on Environmental Law and the United Nations Environment Program recommend bolstering what they call the environmental rule of law, which you can see on both their web, web pages. This will be essential to social ecological well-being in the future decades. Principles that have hitherto been taken for granted will now need to be explicitly acknowledged and cultivated, and none more so than the principle of resilience. Resilience is a characteristic of life, both human and ecological. Resilience is the behavior of rebounding and springing back after experiencing disruption. It is a property of matter, the scientists can see it, engineers can see it in matter, but it is most remarkable in nature, as when human beings, living beings of any species or ecological systems respond to change by recovering and restoring previous capabilities and adapting or evolving anew to a sustainable status. Resiliency has long been admired as in the case of our human capacity to recover from earthquakes and other disasters. Humans have remarked about resilience as a feature of nature and human nature 
for many centuries. Ovid and other classical poets described resilience. In the Renaissance, Francis Bacon in his Silva Savarum, or A Natural History of Ten Centuries in 1672, recognized resilience. The Romantic poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge in his Hymn to the Earth in 1834 extols the earth as divine and celebrates its capacity to renew and give birth anew. His poem exclaims, Mightier far was the joy of thy sudden resilience on the recovery of earth. Most recently, the Stockholm Resilience Center has amassed a deep and richly varied database of studies and research about resilience. Surprisingly, perhaps, the Stockholm Center provides only one inquiry into law and resilience, a conference in 2016 on the law for social ecological resilience. Some legal scholars recognize resil resilience as a property of legal systems, not as a guiding principle applied through legal systems. My colleague and friend, uh, Professor J.B. Rule at Vanderbilt University, proposes a theory of resilience. He stopped short of recognizing it as a principle of law. He posits we should have the resilience approach, which he suggests, quote, relies on adaptive management decisions process and a broad away array of policy instruments, from uh, regulations to common law, dynamic multi-scalar federalism, and network agencies and other actors for its underlying structure. Rule recognizes that encouraging legal systems to support resilience and adaptive management is difficult in the face of business as usual. He concludes, again I quote, when climate change brings a new regime of high variability and low predictability in natural and social systems, the law must be ready. His approach is to do so in the same way that resilience theorists probe other natural and social systems, and it suggests that mapping resilience theory into the legal system is what he calls a fruitful exercise, both in general and in particular applications, such as to prepare law for climate change. As a general principle of law, resilience has a normative role. It is not an elective social policy or merely a desirable element of adaptive management. In human communities, the benefits of resilience can be enhanced and realized, or they can be eroded and denied. This is analogous to a society enjoying a robust system of justice or suffering when the legal elements needed for a just society are lacking. Thus, in order to understand resilience as a legal principle, it is important to probe the roles that resilience serves as a guiding principle of law. Resilience needs to be examined deeply and not just noted instrumentally as either a theory for a legal practice, as Professor Rule argues, or merely a collection of laws with relevance to unexpected change, such as the new field of disaster law, or as occasional legal policies or legislative enactments that are clustered together because they anticipate disruption. Chapter 19 in the uh, book uh, for this conference on the legal foundations uh, for the Global Pact for the Environment posits that resilience is a principle. Dr. Leah Helena Demage from Sao Paulo, Brazil makes a similar case in favor of recognizing resilience as a legal principle and Professor Isabella Michelet observes, and I quote, a more innovative uh, solution for a discussion she makes uh, is the principle of resilience, which would focus environmental action not on simply maintaining environmental stability, but on preserving ecosystem functions, providing the environment with the means to absorb anthropogenic disturbances and recover from them. One objective is to avoid irreversible situations in which an ecosystem becomes vulnerable to the point of losing its resilience. In that sense, the principle of resilience reinforces intergenerational equity. As a legal principle, resilience operates to guide governmental and other decision making. That jurists have not yet closely studied the resilient principle can be attributed to the fact that all of society largely accepts resilience and takes it for granted. 
Once there is a deficit in resilience, that is when a storm is so extreme or an economic collapse so deep that there could be no ready recovery, then the search for understanding resilience as a general principle of law begins. After all, was it not the deficit in human rights in the Second World War that led to the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Similarly, the polluter pays principle existed before Henri Smets advanced it in the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The deficit then was the ambient pollution of the 1960s and 70s, having become so vast in Europe and the United States and elsewhere that the polluters were escaping their responsibility. The proposed Global Pact for the Environment sets forth the legal principle of resilience in Article 16. The parties shall take necessary measures to maintain and restore the diversity and capacity of ecosystems and human communities to withstand environmental disruptions and degradations and to recover and adapt. This articulation has two dimensions. First, it recognizes that ecosystems and human communities have innate resilience and that states as parties to the pact can and must respect and cultivate this resilience. Second, it assigns responsibility to states to maintain and restore this diverse capacity. It should be noted, however, that in addition to states, every person, natural or legal, public or private, also has this duty, as the Global Pact observes generally in Article 2. All persons, as well as governments, can sustain resilience to everyone's mutual benefit. When invoking the principle of resilience, individuals are empowered to propose that governments and other social enterprises act to make possible their recovery from disruptive events. Methodologies should be readied and sustained to facilitate socioeconomic ecological resilience. Preparing to foster resilience can be learned and enhanced. The techniques are often self-evident. In establishing, for instance, fire brigades and programs to prevent fires and provide insurance for the recovery from fire risks. In Paris, fire brigades date from the 13th century, when in 1254, Louis authorized the Guillaume Bourgeois, the Burgess Watch, allowing for the residents of Paris to establish their own night watches separate from the king's night watches to prevent and stop fires. In 1736, in Philadelphia, Benjamin Franklin organized a volunteer fire department for the city. We find this kind of resilience, preparedness, and practice in many parts of the world today, but not universal yet. Many local human settlements lack building codes that, that, uh, and lack fire protection and fire brigades. Even when building codes exist to promote uh, resilience in, in the design of the structures, corruption, and a failure to enforce the standards effectively nullifies the purposes and neglect, such as in the tragic Grenfell Tower in London in 2017, uh, this neglect can uh, have tragic results. But resilience has positive results. We see this uh, just last week when Cyclone Fani hit the Odisha coast of India. After the great cyclone in 1999, when 10,000 people died, India, together with the Indian Institute of Technology, decided to create uh, and design uh, structures for the evacuation of citizens along the coast, uh, cement, cement buildings. They had situated them all, and they had practiced their emergency regime so that when Cyclone Fanny hit to India, one million people were safely evacuated from the coast into these shelters, and only 17 or so people died, and mostly from windborne uh, uh, accidents. The United Nations Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction is premised on fostering resilience. In this state practice, resilience emerges as more significant than just a framework for international cooperation. It is a manifestation of the principle of resilience itself. Hospitals do this when they have emergency generators, so that when they lose the centrally uh, available systems of electricity, uh, they can continue their medical care. Uh, we've seen stockpiling and, and practices of, of uh, backup systems, uh, and the failure of doing that, as in 2011, 
when floodwaters inundated Bangladesh and the uh, factories there that provided the computer chips, most of the world's manufacturing computers, stopped the uh, transnational manufacturing for a time. So when states and other parties acknowledge the principal resilience, they are likely to take measures necessary to provide for social, ecological, and economical resilience. When they don't, there will be uh, a commensurate uh, uh, failing and disaster. The principal resilience is a norm for our time to cope with the disruptions of the Anthropocene. Nelson Mandela said, do not judge me by my successes. Judge me by how many times I fell down and got up again. The Anthropocene promises to test all individuals with a kind of treatment not unlike that which humans subjected Mandela to. Perhaps the most important benefit of states recognizing the principle of resilience will be to build in their citizens the capacity to bounce back again and again. Thank you very much.